This has been a long week for me. I don't know about you, but uh, my brain's a little saturated by this point. Yeah? Anyone else with me on that? Yeah, all right, rock on. Uh, yeah, not a little, a lot, right? How many of us are here for the first time? Welcome, wow, that's probably uh, a third, a, a quarter of us here. Um, I, hope we, I hope you'll come back again. Uh, this is my favorite event of the year. I'm a little bit biased. I'll, I'll tell you about my bio in a minute. But um, yeah, I, I always learn a lot when I come to the past summit. And I don't even attend sessions. I uh, watch sessions myself afterwards. And I always use this as an opportunity to connect with people because I can watch, watch sessions anytime. But there is only one week of the year where I can meet 4,000 other passionate SQL Server professionals, and that's this week. So that's what I spend my time doing this, this week, is meeting people and talking with them and going down there and talking to the Microsoft people who write the product that I work in and make a living off of. And uh, uh, then I circle all those boxes on the, uh, the schedule and I watch hundreds of uh, sessions by the end of the year. I don't know if you've noticed this when you look at the sessions available, that uh, at least for me, maybe you're uh, unlike me, but at least for me, there's like always four or more sessions I want to see at any given time anyway. You know, so I'm living with FOMO, you know, fear of missing out, just by looking at the schedule. So what I, I don't even look at it. I'm like, oh, I'll come back to that. I'll buy the little, um, the DVD thing or the little uh, thumb drive, and then I come back to that later on. Okay, so this session is actually a specially requested session, and uh, it was one that was asked for by the membership, by the community, effective requirements gathering, how to do a good job of building a collection of requirements that will end up with an effective outcome, right? One in which the users of your product or your service will be happy and they will be satisfied with it. So one of the things that, um, uh, that comes out of that, there's a slide that we're about to go past quickly in just a moment, um, is that your evaluations matter a lot, right? So do take the time to fill out your survey results, tell the past organizers how you liked or disliked or add constructive criticism, uh, criticisms to the uh, different sessions that you've attended. You know, sometimes uh, some speakers are great, but their slides weren't as good, right? The, give that kind of positive uh, but helpful feedback uh, as well as make it known to the past organizers what else you want to see. You know, more data science. Or this year, for those of you who have uh, been here many times, or at least once in the past, this year's a little bit heavy on soft skills compared to some years we'd have like six sessions on soft skills. This year, when you look, there was probably 20. And the reason for that is pe people have said, I have a lot of ways to learn now, but one thing I'm not getting a lot of is specially tailored serve, um, kind of soft skills like requirements gathering for database people, right? There's not a lot of people who know both databases and requirements gathering, or databases and how to manage up to your boss. And so that was one of the um, special re requests that came out of it. Here are some extra things you can do throughout the year to stay active with the community. Uh, another thing I would encourage you to do is if you don't participate much in social media, get a Twitter account and get a Slack account. There's a fantastic community on sqlcommunity.slack.com. It's a really good discussion forums on all kinds of topics, not just pass. I'm talking about uh, dbatools.io, right? If you've ever heard of this really amazing PowerShell toolkit, the uh, owners and writers of that code are very active there. So you could talk to them. Or if you have a question about availability group, groups, then there's a, a a channel for that. Uh, if you're on Twitter, don't use the Twitter user interface. Use tweetdeck.twitter.com. And the, what that does is that gives you channels. So you can see everything you subscribe to uh, that you follow, which is usually just this kind of stream you know, of, of stuff that's hitting you like a fire hose full of water. That's not helpful. What's helpful is the hashtag SQL help. You put out a question. 
you know, what is it, 150 characters or 300 characters or less, hashtag SQL help, you're going to get extremely high value, high, um, uh, highly vetted answer within three minutes. I'm not kidding. I'm talking about like people like my friend here, Ben, uh, Microsoft MVPs, people who have written books on the topic, right? People who work at Microsoft. So definitely do that. Um, my name is Kevin Klein. I work for Century One. I hope you came by and saw us down there in the exhibit hall. And I'm active on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, all those places as K.E. Klein. Uh, my email address, though, is kklein at century1.com, and I'll answer all questions. I, uh, I know a lot about SQL Server, a lot about um, SQL code. I used to work with Oracle and MySQL, PostgreSQL, uh, PostgreSQL as well a lot. So. Um, I do a lot of architectural work. If I don't know the answer to the question that you might send my way, I know someone who does know the answer to that question. So I'm always happy to help. Um, I get teased a lot, too. It's not here on the list, but I have a big family. I have one son and six daughters. And so uh, um, and if you get to know me online, you know, through Twitter or something like that, that's the horde. So people say, hey, Kevin, how's the horde doing? And, and uh, so um, uh, that's something I'll get teased about publicly pretty often. I was one of the original founders of PASS. Uh, there were nine of us that got together and founded the organization back in early 1999. And then we had the first conference in uh, late in that year. And uh, I was president for a few years. And I've, I'm like one of a dozen people, I think, or maybe uh, 16 or 17 people that have been to all of the PASS summits over the years. So uh, if you're ever interested, I can tell you some horror stories about things that went sideways or things like that in, in years past. So evaluations, I already talked about this. It's important. Your opinion matters. Your opinion will make a difference in future past summits. They'll make a difference in um, other past run events. For example, PASS has an event called 24 Hours of Pass. Anyone attended that one, 24 Hours of Pass? It's literally back-to-back -back webinars all day long for 24 hours. So you could be in Taiwan or you could be in France and you're still watching sessions that are going on around the clock. Usually they're thematic in nature. So one year it might be high performance and then another year it might be um, maybe advance your skills to the next level. Things that are coming in importance like machine learning that you may not be doing today. Then there's another kind of event called pass marathons. They're eight hours of back-to-back -back webinars and again, your opinion matters. That will form the basis for the things that PASS decides to do later. Uh, also, before we jump into the agenda, I do want to say, please vote. Your opinion counts there as well. We have fantastic candidates. I know all six of the candidates, three of whom are international candidates. So if anyone's from elsewhere in the world, holla, you know, represent for my peeps. Um, so um, we have people from Canada, we have people from Europe, we have people from down under, uh, New Zealand. Well, that's not, I don't think New Zealanders consider themselves down under, but uh, I'm not sure. Um, in any event, uh, they're, they're all great people. So read their, uh, you know, their idea statements and interview content and you know, choose some, some people you want to see get up there. So. What are we talking about today? Uh, you can see the agenda for yourself. Introductory concepts, application development methodologies, focusing on requirements. We're going to talk about storytelling uh, in a little bit. And uh, you know, the, the usual kind of wrap up with some resources and time for Q&A. But let me get to know you a little bit better. How many of us here are in charge of a product or a project or some kind of effort like that? Okay, a few of us. I hope you could actually come up here and teach all of us about this, but I completely understand if that's uh, something that you're, uh, you're wanting to learn more about or maybe learn some different skills. Uh, for example, I'm gonna talk about both traditional waterfall te um, approach techniques and what we call the agile set of techniques. So maybe if you're pretty much in one and not the other, we'll cover both of them. How many of us here maybe are um, we are, let's say, consultants, individual contributors. We have to, a couple of us, one, two, three of us, okay. So in cases like that, you might be writing statements of work, um, kind of specifications, and uh, you know, you don't write that just the right way. You're, 
your client might have you over a barrel, right? And you, wow, I didn't really think I was committing to 80 hours of work for something I thought was eight hours of work, but yeah, that can certainly happen to us too. Uh, so let's dive in and, and look at this a little bit. So let's start at the beginning with properly gathering your requirements. And whenever you talk about requirements, what we're really talking about is communication, right? It's not so much about the technology. And so according to communication theory, we have a big loop that happens with communication. It starts with a person who is sending a message. And what they have to do is inside of their brain, they will put together based on their vocabulary, their experiences, their knowledge of idioms and catchphrases and jargon and all that. They'll put together, they'll encode this message. And that message is coming from their brain, their brain may not send out a message that is completely understandable to everyone else in the world, right? Uh, that message is going to be immediately affected by the channel or the medium through which we're communicating it, right? It makes sense. Spoken word impacts us differently than written word. Has anyone sat through the keynote where Wendy Pastrick sings the financials? Everybody hates the financials part of the keynote. And then last year, Wendy pa uh, Pastrick sang the financials, and everybody said that was my favorite part of the keynote. Uh, it's one of these things where she, uh, uh, she, she brought it to life, right? And here's an interesting thing that all of us know from our experiences with music, is that music can af affect our emotions in a way that spoken word does not. In fact, neurologists have mapped that out in our brains, and it's because music is processed in a space in our brain that is immediately adjacent to our emotional processing centers, right? So the medium makes a huge difference. Then we have the person who is receiving that message, right? And they have to take all of their experiences, their vocabulary, their knowledge of idioms and usages and anecdotal kind of uh, experiences with the things you're talking about, and they have to decode and extract meaning out of what you're saying. And I'm probably belaboring a point that you know thoroughly, but we have all gone through many hundreds of experiences, hopefully many of them have dropped out of our mind because they were not traumatic or scarring to us, where there was some kind of tragic misunderstanding, right? So like um, in my case, uh, a, a kind of funny uh, example of that is uh, I remarried in 2008 uh, my first wife and I split up in 2005. I met someone in 2006. We started dating. It took a while, but we decided to settle down. And uh, one, one day she was talking about, why are you such a punk about X, Y, Z? Now, in her, in her mind, saying you're a punk about something was kind of like you're a jokester, right? In my mind, the word punk meant a thug, right? Um, and so... It, you know, I don't think that particular situation resolved itself in tears, but I was probably crying a lot somewhere down that line. So, yeah, this is one of those things where we just didn't have the same baseline, right, as each other. And, of course, this gets really hard for us as technologists because we are working in a world in which we have a great deal of diversity. So we have people from all over the world that are working with us. Um, how many of us have gone to Microsoft sessions? I hope everyone raises their hand or something, right? And two-thirds of the speakers, I think, are not English as a first language kind of situation, right? So I think they're doing tremendously well. Um, sending us the right encoded messages for us to understand what's going on. But there's plenty of times where it doesn't work out quite right, and it's, it's either because of our own knowledge of how to communicate or perhaps our own misunderstanding of how a person will receive that message. Okay? And so the, the receiver gets the message, and typically they're going to send acknowledging statements back. They may send clarifying questions back, uh, or they may formulate a new message based on what you, the, the sender, has shipped out. So we get this feedback to continue the loop of communication. And yet despite that, we have at every level and in every situation noise, 
right? Now, I'm not talking about background music that is making it hard for us to talk on the phone to our loved ones, which you know is certainly a sort of noise. But I'm talking about things like um, confirmation bias, right? I'm talking about things like filter bias. Um, for example, how many of us have no problem, no hesitation to tell our boss really bad news, right? Most, oh, okay, a couple of, I see some hands going out, right? It's like that, that SOB can take it all the way down. Um, yeah, a lot of us don't like, in fact, this is a, a really common issue in organizational studies, is how do we get truthful reporting up the chain of command? Because each level of hierarchy you go up, less and less bad news is, is actually carried truthfully up the hierarchy. Uh, I'm talking about things like jargon. I had a friend uh, back in the early days, back when I worked at, uh, in my early days of my career, back when I worked at NASA, who um, was kind of uh, an introverted soul, and he, he didn't like to have conversations that went on for very long. So I could tell when he was about ready to be done with a conversation when the acronym started rolling out, right? And he'd say things like, uh, to a business person, he's like, well, clearly you, you need to get FDDDI installed, FIDI installed, and, and um, we need to get you off this token ring stuff, and then we'll have to set the TCP IP protocols. We'll use IP config for that, and we're gonna have to make sure your IP numbers are between this range and that. And the person would like glaze over, you know, and there, there is a little drool coming out of the corner of their mouth. And, uh, but that was intentional. That jargon he knew was a wall that would, you know, turn them away. I'm also talking about some things that are really, really prone to happen with IT people. A very kind of, a very common kind of noise that we don't realize we're broadcasting is information overload, okay? So like a real common thing for IT people to do when they want to uh, convince someone to do, their, uh, do a project their way is they'll give you all the facts and reasons why this is a good idea. And that's a bad idea because nobody's gonna read all that. What you want is what's called the bluff acronym, bottom line, up front. Hey, I want us to use this particular vendor. I've got a lot of reasons for it. It's gonna save us time, it's gonna save us money. It's three sentences. And then after that, you say, if you wanna know why I think that, read on. And here's all my benchmarking te uh, test cases, and here's all my customer, um, what do they call those case studies, you know, that show that they had the same challenges we did and it saw. So if you lead with detail, that's noise for a lot of people, right? So we're gonna come back over and over again to this kind of set of concepts about how does communication work properly? Because so much of running a project, particularly from the standpoint of starting with requirements, validating them, prioritizing them, and then seeing them through to execution. So much of that is about communication, right? Um, another kind of noise is emotional overload, right? So I mentioned I have this horde of kids. Um, now my oldest is 28 and my youngest is 16. One son, six daughters. I know it's probably, uh, going to get me in trouble, but I will say there is a little bit of a, um, there is a little bit of a gender situation here with emotional overloading, because my son is never emotional about anything, even things he should be emotional about. He's like, oh, this is going to be fine, Dad. It's like you ran over their dog, and you can't be fine about that, you know. Or with my daughters, everything is emotional. Our joke around the house is, it's always drama, right? It's like, well, Casey's boyfriend didn't call Casey at the time she said he was going, and she found out he was texting someone else. Like, who was that person? She's like, well, you know, it doesn't matter. It was, he, he was supposed to. And I'm like, okay, all right. Uh, there's a lot of emotions here, I see. Um, that changes the dynamic of our conversation, right? So it's one of these things that um, we have to be aware of it. If we're not aware of it and we're not deliberately constructing countermeasures, then they can be really big, really big impediments. I did a session earlier this week about communicating with our peers, and uh, if you have the opportunity to go back and review that, you might want to. I talk a lot about things like active listening and how to do that really effectively, and uh, don't have time for that, but it is, 
you know, it is an important set of concepts if you've never studied those before. Now, another thing I want to make sure that we talk about as an introductory concept is this, uh, you know, the whole idea of nonverbal communications. In a face-to-face -face discussion, as much as 65, 75 or more percent of the, the meaning of what you're talking about is conveyed through nonverbal means. Your body language, your posture, uh, the way you speak, your intonation, your cadence, the speed of your speech. You know, if somebody's talking really fast and they don't really specify a lot of the details that you're really focusing on, then it becomes hard. You see what I'm saying? And it becomes hard to focus on someone who is a really fast speaker, but if someone slows down and adds these pregnant pauses, you begin to focus in on exactly what they're saying, right? So these kinds of things make a big difference. And I always like to joke about this in the sense of, have you ever had a, a friend who, A, did not use a lot of emojis, and B, liked to be sarcastic in email, right? How did those email conversations go, right? Probably a train wreck because people are like, are you serious when you said, no, we don't need to do that? And they're like, no, I meant, no, we don't need to do that. You know, uh, that kind of thing happens a lot. And then finally, I also like to point out, a lot of us kind of overlook this idea of symbols and uh, a word you may not have heard of, semiotics, uh, the, the significance of imagery and uh, uh, if you have ever read Dan Brown, The Da Vinci Code, Professor Langdon is a professor of semiotics, right? So this also comes into play in a lot of different ways in our situations. Like if you're sitting with a group of people doing a workshop around building requirements and uh, everyone's dressed like us, and then someone walks in in a three-piece suit with a power tie on, there's some symbolism with this, right? Either that person is a salesperson, right? We all know, oh, look, the salespeople are here. They're, you know, it's, they're going to try and sell us a pure storage array or something like that. Or it's one of the bosses, right? It's these, these strange creatures that wear their own uniform that none of us really would ever wear willingly. Right? Um, or you know, think of it this way. Why do pilots, airline pilots, wear military-style uniforms that display rank? What do we as passengers need to know about rank? It's about respect, it's about confidence, it's about trust, right? So I, I will say this too, before we start to get into specifics about the uh, requirements gathering, if you want to exhibit an implicit understanding that I am confident, that I am in control, that I'm trustworthy, don't go in there and shoes that you've been wearing for seven years that nearly have heels worn down. And ladies, I'm not talking to you, you know that. Um, a lot of us guys will wear jeans, you know, that have stains on them. And you know, it's like, you can see that I had Doritos this afternoon at lunch. Don't do that, because you are communicating massive amounts of information, okay? I'm not telling you to overdress or anything like that, but I am saying, Look the part. It will make a very big difference in how you are perceived and received. Anyone seen this famous kind of picture? Right? This is, this, you know, pictures of that, uh, says a thousand words. The idea that um, what I have in my mind is the, the, the tire swing, right? That's what I want as the customer. But everybody else, because of the way we're communicating these, um, these different words, it's not working quite the right way, right? And so we are, you know, I, I love the one about, uh, is it um, how, the, how the product was documented, right? <laughs> At the end of the project, it's like, whoa, we're running out of time. I guess we're gonna have a three-page pamphlet for documentation instead of the 30-page book we thought we were gonna have, right? Or um, uh, some of the other ones, are are just really funny here that are new. I, I had seen like the first four of those, but this particular image had the roller coaster um, added to it. You know, how the customer wants this, uh, you know. I always uh, uh, tease bosses, because I do a, a lot of leadership training uh, for IT people as well, and it's like, do not ask your team to compose a Mozart level um, 
a Mozart level symphony in 12 days when all you've given them are gazoos, right? You know, you as a manager have a lot to do with how these things are gonna play out, right? And so um, understand that you are a limiting factor too and your decisions are in situations when you're trying to get people to do something for you. It's a creative effort, but you can't expect miracles, right? So now let's, again, this is still a little bit introductory. Now we're getting deeper. Now let's start talking about development of software, but also you could apply this in a lot of ways to any number of different kinds of projects in which you have to communicate with the, um, whoever the, your customers might be and formulate opinions about what they're saying and decode those in your own mind if we go back to the, to the diagram and uh, produce an output from that, right? So in this case, what we're looking at is uh, in a very widespread world with uh, really hundreds of different ways to, to conduct your project management, there's two main ways that we see out in the world. And I don't think we'll ever see one completely win over the other. For example, I worked for NASA and for the Department of Defense for the first seven years uh, of my career, or maybe more, I'm old, I'm losing track, right? Um, and uh, at that time, all we had was what we call waterfall technique. You'll hear people refer to it by other names too. Sometimes you'll hear them say traditional. Sometimes you'll hear them say SDLC, which means the software development life cycle. However, a lot of people kind of contest using SDLC because a software development life cycle could be one that's agile, right? It's, it's a more generic term. Um, so SDLC, waterfall, traditional, what we mean here is we do a lot of analysis up front, a lot of um, investigation, maybe we do a lot of requirements writing and other kinds of written documents, and then when that part is finished, we move on to the next, and that kind of falls over the waterfall and we finish the next part of uh, maybe starting to write specifications, so, you know, the next deeper level of detail. And we get that done and it falls down. So what we have with, um, with Waterfall is a process that is really heavy in terms of the, um, the preponderance of work that happens early and the fact that everything depends on that early work to successfully complete in time at the end. And so one of the things that I always joke about from my own past as a product manager and a leader of development teams is what happens when it comes to a point in time that we're doing our quality assurance. And uh, by that time we figured out that we're already behind. And so, uh, you know, the software development manager says, well, we've got a month set aside for quality assurance and testing, so we'll cut that back to three weeks. And then after the dev team gets that extra week, they say, well, let's cut that back to two weeks because we really don't have that much time, but we'll test at night, we'll work some long hours, we'll get it done, all the while thinking, oh, we won't have any findings from our call, right? Part of that time is there to fix all the problems, right? Not just to find out if there are problems or not. Conversely, um, Agile, so, um, and that's not to say that waterfall is bad. I don't want to give you that impression. And it is often the best uh, approach for many situations. Per, per, for example, uh, situations that have a whole lot of legal ramifications. So if you're going to write a, uh, uh, you're an independent contractor, you're going to write an application for a bank that is public facing, that has a lot of security <coughs> issues and a lot of legal issues, or something for government. It's probably gonna be waterfall, whether you like it or not. Or it may be hybrid, but it won't be entirely agile. Agile, on the other hand, if I go back a little bit, the idea for agile is we don't have time to do it right, believe it or not. But what we do have time to do is do it a little bit wrong, but over and over again, it gets better over time, right? So agile has this concept that doesn't exist so much in Waterfall called Minimum Viable Product. Anyone heard of that? Yeah. Not everybody here has, so I'm, 
I'm glad I taught some of you one thing <laughs> so far. Right, the idea is, you know, okay, we are gonna build a, a, a project for uh, timekeeping for a, um, a medical practice. And, uh, well, what's, what do we have to do first? Well, we gotta, you know, get their name, and then we gotta figure out when they checked in, uh, when they clocked in, when they clocked out, how they spent their hours throughout the day. Okay, so that's what we'll do as a minimum, but then we'll do, um, it'll look like a spreadsheet to start with, but then we'll start to build in all kinds of additional things on the next, um, on the next sprint that adds a little more features and then a little bit more features until finally, it's not just the minimum the customer needs to be happy, it's actually something that's gonna make them very happy, okay? How about DevOps? Any of us heard that term? Yeah? Anyone actually work in a DevOps environment? One, two, okay. DevOps means a lot of different things, all right? Um, but one of the key things to, for those of us in the database world to think about with DevOps, what this means for most of us is uh, two kind of main facets. The first is a really strong source control system for your code. So if as a DBA, you have never really done much beyond say, create stored, you know, create procedure such and such name, and then you just look in the database to see what, it, what these artifacts are, now you're gonna actually put your code into Git, right? And you're gonna have forks when things need to have different sets of features, and you're gonna uh, really manage that carefully. That's the first thing. The second thing that uh, DevOps means for most of us is that it also means CICD. That's another set of acronyms. Continuous integration, continuous deployment. So, and I'll give you an example. Oh, back when I ran the, uh, the, uh, the database team for one of the big four accounting firms, we would uh, have this really rigid change control board that would say, okay, now we're ready for the next big set of deployments to happen. Maybe once a quarter we would do these kind of things. So we're gonna roll out a new set of changes. Well, back in those days, the worst possible situation we could have was if we rolled out the new, um, the new software, we rolled out maybe the new database schema changes and things like that, and then two or three days after that, them going live, we found out there was a big problem. That means we now have to roll back everything. But because we didn't have a good source control system, we didn't know where we were in terms of the database design and where we were in terms of the application design. So if we rolled back the app without really spending days and days and days coordinating things, then the database would be out of sync with the application. And let me just say, uh, you, you hated the job because you lost a lot of weekends, right, trying to make that stuff work well. Um, whereas when you're doing DevOps, all of the things that happen at a given increment can be completely reversed if they need to be. Everything, right? Okay, so that's uh, two different ways to look at it. Waterfall is heavy on analysis with really big bang kind of releases. This is back in the old days when we got CDs and DVDs for all of our software. You're like, yay, two years have passed, I'm gonna get my new DVD and I'm gonna install all this new SQL Server 2008. Um, nowadays, if you're running a SQL, uh, Azure SQL database every month, even actually, in some cases, more frequently than that, little, little tiny features are added to SQL Server as we go along. Maybe a tiny improvement in the optimizer, right? Just very small things. But because of the way we've constructed this, we can define what we need to, um, uh, we spec it all out, build it, release it. They have a Q&A process. It's called the Canary region of the Azure data centers. And so you can sign up to be part of that and uh, those servers will actually get that new feature before everybody else. They'll monitor it ve that very closely, see if there's any anomalies, and if there are, they roll it back. But 99% of the time there aren't, and it goes out in general, uh, into the general population there before long. Okay, sorry about my glitch with my mouse there. Um, documentation styles, okay? Um, it's heavy on the wa waterfall style. And typically, uh, this is just based on my own experiences, it's formal. 
it almost looks like it was written by a lawyer, you know? Uh, and uh, everything's in the third person, you know? The, you, uh, the customer will do this and such to perform this and kind of function. And it's like, wow. Um, that's, that took me a long time to parse that and figure out what you really mean by that. So we have all of these different elements that often happen in the, um, in the waterfall methodology where we have you know, the charter and then we have a business case definition, we have the cost benefits analysis, we have lots of documents. And many of those documents are dozens and dozens of pages. Um, Agile, on the other hand, can vary. Some Agile projects can be very heavy on documentation, but that's not the requirement. Uh, it can be very, very flexible as to what you keep track of and to what degree of uh, fidelity you record all of these details on. Uh, I'll show in just a moment some of the really common um, ways of working on Agile projects and writing, and one of the most common tools, which I love with Agile, is the, the three by five index card, right? Or maybe a post-it note. It's amazing what you can get done with those things. So if your project is uh, able to be a little bit more loose, then do that, right? And again, what I'm showing here is that in some cases, you know, if you're uh, building really important systems, you're gonna be a lot more formal. Whereas if, uh, you know, if you're building like, for example, I have a pacemaker. Uh, I have a heart defect and, and I've died clinically five times, so I can't imagine uh, what the, uh, uh, the level of uh, intensity the team at Biometrics reviews their uh, requirements. But you know that they're serious about it because you know, people's lives are on the line with that kind of stuff. Whereas if you're building the software for an RC car that uh, Junior is going to play with, eh, it's probably going to be pretty loose and pretty flexible, right? So why do IT projects fail? Why do these uh, development processes, why, when we're as a uh, consultant hired to do some work for someone, why do they go astray? And this is, uh, this is fairly recent from 2015. And it tells us uh, we have 10 things, the top 10, the, the surveys, if you actually look up the survey, it actually shows the top 25 things. But the top 10 are enough to uh, point out to us in red, did I do that right? I'm red, green, colorblind as well. So uh, did I put some of these in red? Okay, woohoo! All right. Um, so in red, what we've got, these are typically issues of communication, right? If the, uh, a chief executive, not a chief executive, if, if you don't have an executive sponsor or their, their sponsorship is limited, Either they haven't communicated that well enough to you, or you haven't sussed that out well enough by interrogating them to find out, are you going to support us all the way through to the end, right? It's a big deal when you don't get that kind of support. Uh, number four, clear business objectives. It could not be simpler that that is a communication problem, right? So which has a higher rate of success? Um, Waterfall tends to have a, um, a higher failure rate, no, again, not because there's something wrong with waterfall, but because the way waterfall is constructed um, and laid out, you have these kind of big releases, right? So if with Agile, you do six releases in the next 12 months, you have proportionately, you know, if we look at it as percentages, a lot more chances to get something right. Whereas if you have one or two releases in the next 12 months under waterfall, you only have one or two chances to get this baby right. And even if you get one of the two wrong, that's a 50% failure rate, right? So um, in some ways you would say uh, the statistical methodology is a little bit flawed because it gives agile an advantage uh, when you uh, assess these in terms of statistics, but that's the reality of agile. Agile was developed as an answer to the problems of the waterfall, waterfall technique, okay? Um, if we are to look at, oh, uh, I'm gonna apologize because these fonts are gonna look ugly here. Um, if we look at the two, and this comes directly from the um, Agile Manifesto. Can you read that? It says individuals and interactions. 
Is, it, is that okay? It's in red, yeah, I apologize for that. And I have no idea what this color is. Uh, tan? Pink. 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 Oh, wow, lovely. Um, right, so here on the one hand, what we are talking about are Im major points of emphasis for Agile. Over here on the right-hand side, these are major points of emphasis for a waterfall. Uh, the, waterfall plan, uh, the waterfall approach emphasizes you stick to a plan, okay? So what we've got here is the answer to a lot of problems for a lot of people. When you move to Agile, it's individuals and interactions between those inter uh, individuals that's most important, more so than sticking to the specific tools and processes. In fact, that's one of the things that had hurt for a while the, um, the enormous Indian IT uh, economy. It grew up and exploded massively through Y2K. Remember Y2K? Everybody had to get up to uh, certified on Y2K. And so that sort of approach of using a waterfall strategy on big mainframe software works really well. But what began to happen, um, 2004, 2008, companies were saying, okay, now we want you to be really fast and really flexible. And when your emphasis is on process, it's really hard to be fast and flexible. When I, uh, uh, 10 years, I worked for a, a competitor of Century One, and we had a, a big Indian lab, we had a big lab in Russia, we had labs in other places around the world. And one of the things we found was that our Indian lab was really good at those structured sorts of projects, but we did a lot of our work that we needed a lot of flexibility uh, we did that in Israel or in Russia. Uh, the Russians are like, I'm an artist, uh, you know, and you are capitali capitalist decadence. Um, so um, uh, they were really good at those flexible kinds of situations that required that responding to change much more so than, than sticking to a rigid plan that was certified ISO 90,001 um, credential, right? Any questions before we um, keep keep going and get into the deeper stuff? Yes. I have two questions. The definition of project failure is it different between agile and waterfall? So the question is: Is there a big difference between how agile and waterfall defines a project's failure? And not really. Um, a project failure is uh, not only a point at which the the dev uh, the developers are unable to move forward uh, and continue to build and, and release. It's also, it also represents a, um, a, a lack of support from the people who you are building that project for, right? So if you are unable to go forward, the project may not have failed because they may bring in another team to conclude all of the, uh, all of the work that needs to be done. But when you have both a team that is unable to go forward, and users or consumers or customers who are unwilling to invest in you going forward, that's when it's failed. That's when it's done, right? All right, so let's take a look at the flip side of uh, top 10 uh, reasons that projects have failed, and I'll look at frequent mistakes, okay? So super common mistake is to talk to the customers once, right? If you're doing Agile right, uh, now Waterfall is different. You have a very exhaustive kind of interview process in uh, Waterfall, but in, in, um, in Agile in particular, you're gonna be talking to them on the regular. So like our team at uh, Century One, we have Slack channels that are just for customers who wanna participate in the next generation of our products, right? And so we're constantly talking to them about what do they like, what do they dislike, what would help them more, what would be less helpful, that sort of stuff. This is a very common thing. So as I mentioned, 10 years on the board of directors for PASS, a few years of that as the president. And so we would, we would be, as a board of directors, having a discussion like, we need to get a uh, website in place that is really fast and effective for our end users. That's kind of the project scope, right? We're gonna redo our website, it's gonna be fast and effective. 
Now, the, and I kid you not, the first generation of PASS's website was written on cold fusion against an Oracle database. And so if you were on the PASS website and it threw an error, you saw clearly that the SQL Server Professional Association was having Oracle error messages right there on the screen, right? Um, so um, it does seem wrong, doesn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of scary. But so what would happen in our board discussion? Very first thing that would happen is other really good SQL Server people who had maybe written reps, websites and stuff like that is, oh, well, we need to use this and such programming language and because it's better about this and this and this. And, and you know, we could get Microsoft to give us some free licenses of Visual Studio version, whatever it was. And you know, so they went right down into the details before we really fully knew and had fully mapped out what the scope was, what do we need out of this. And that happens all the time for us technologists because our job is to make things work and to fix problems. And you really have to listen to the full problem to be effective at succeeding with these kinds of really uh, intense projects, yeah? Um, another big problem that we have is a situation in which we haven't built out the right set of um, priorities so like a real common rule of thumb, I learned it in a different circumstance um, about prioritizing. Back in high school, one of the things my dad taught me, ironically, he was an analog computer engineer. So um, maybe they teach this in, in the, uh, the project design schools back then, but he, he would tell me with uh, homework, always work on the hardest thing first. Um, you know, in my case, I was struggling with math. He's like, always do your math first because you're good at English. That's easy. It's like coasting, right? But if you struggle with um, math and you do it first, you still have a little energy left over to get done with that English. But if you start with the English stuff, you'll feel like you've worked. And when you now have to go and tackle that calculus, you'll be like, holy cow, I just don't have it in me, right? Same thing about prioritizing. Let's say you're going to make a new website. Don't spend much time on that login page, right? That's easy stuff. That's not what's going to throw the project off, off track, right? And the next, you know, the really important thing that they want for you to be able to do uh, to, uh, to provide, uh, let's say you're going to provide a bunch of uh, uh, data sets and it will then go and do some machine learning for you and give, uh, give you back some predictions. That's hard, right? do that, spend, spend that time on that particular requirement, make that your priority. Because if you struggle, and you struggle there, then you know you need to make a really rudimentary login page at the end. You can get that done in no time at all, okay? And then making an assumption. So this is, again, another thing you want to do very uh, explicitly during your assessment and analysis of each, uh, each of the different stop points that you have in your project, whether it be Waterfall or uh, Agile, in which you say, well, what am I assuming? Um, in fact, um, in fact, there's a, a certain set of questions which we're going to go through in just a moment that you want to make sure that you um, ask every time. Because once you say, OK, what am I assuming? Oh, I'm assuming this person knows exactly what I mean when I say, a CSV file or a tab delimited file. When I assume that, what are other things? Because we're marketing this as mass market, you know, any business person, it's so easy any business person could use. Then now I need to recognize that maybe uh, the millennials that I'm uh, trying to sell this to don't know these other historic artifacts that I'm carrying around in my head. Like my, uh, one of my daughters is a third year anthropology student. And one of the things she has to, um, uh, take as a class on um, uh, geographic information systems. And so she was struggling, and the professor said, um, well, you know, this, this workshop is really easy. All you got to do is open the file, put it in, uh, answer the question. And she said, I, I don't know what this file folder is you're talking about. And of course, when she told me that story, I was kind of like, <laughs> I'm a computer professional. I didn't teach my daughter about file folders. Um, so I let you down, Savannah. I'm really sorry about that. But um, yeah, so he never expected that a person could not know what a file folder is too, right? And so that's the kind of thing that happens to us a lot. We make assumptions, and we really should not, uh, should not do that. Now, another thing too that's kind of interesting, this Moscow uh, method, 
Um, and the Moscow method is uh, uh, just a way in which you can, it's a reminder, it's a mnemonic. Um, what does that mean? Sorry? Yeah, it means must, uh, should, could, would. So when you're talking, uh, uh, you know, the idea is prioritizing. When you're looking at a requirement and you've had five different people tell you um, some requirements that all match up across all five of them, but then you've got a lot of disagreement on the next three that each of them gave you, you look at each one and say, is this a must do? Is it a should do? Is it a could do, meaning you know, we could do this next year, or a would do? I would do this if I had all the time in the world. right? So th just use that as a little mnemonic to remember to ask yourself each time you see a requirement, is it a must do, should do, et cetera. And this is one I can't talk enough about. I got burned by Microsoft, actually, very seriously by this. Uh, back in the day, in the 90s, uh, Microsoft built into um, Exchange a feature called WebDAV. And it was a, a programming model. And the, uh, the Microsoft TAM, that, not a TAM, but it was a direct liaison that worked in our offices at the big four company, talked to um, our CIO into building a big application on WebDAV, which was hierarchical in nature. It was not a relational database. And what it really needed was a relational database with transactional consistency and the ability to roll back if things went wrong. And so we made this big, probably a $2 million bet. It took uh, 15 people a year and a half to fail, right? Don't go with the new stuff. Uh, go with the reliable stuff. Uh, that's always my message to data people. It's like, let the, let the little startups take the risks. If you're supporting a big enterprise, then don't, <laughs> don't put yourself at risk just because you're going to try something new and shiny. So you're saying nobody should use SQL 2019? I'm saying no one should use SQL 2019. Uh, well, funny story. Uh, <laughs> no, I, no I, am not, uh, I am not saying that. But when I was a young man, um, there, there used to be a saying, some of you are, are young folks, although I do see a few gray hairs in here. Um, you might remember the old saying uh, in the era of personal computers, never install a version one of Microsoft products, always wait to version three. Um, that's kind of true now, except it's, uh, it's, uh, it's cumulative updates, right? So when um, SQL Server 2019 rolled out, if you somehow got the very first bits and applied, there was actually a cumulative update or a service pack, I can't remember which it was, I'm sorry, a hotfix, that was out before the, before the end of the eight hour period of when it was announced and the end of the business day that it was announced. So um, yeah, hold off a little bit, okay? Now if you were running it on a release candidate and you were doing some dev work on that, that's fine. But you know you've already hedged your bet because you're on a dev server, right? So again, also as a sidebar, but related, if you ever see a company that's like, we do all of our work in production, don't apply for that job, right? <laughs> all right, so scope. Scope is our first level of requirements, right? We set the scope um, uh, maybe with a statement of work, or we have a, um, a, PO, uh, you know, a POC that has a scope statement, and you want, in particular, for it to kind of set the guardrails of what is out of bounds. Uh, that's one of the key things you want, so that the developers, say in our example about uh, a machine learning for everyone kind of product, you don't want them to try and solve every problem everywhere in the world. In fact, I had a friend who got some funding for a startup about bringing machine learning to all of the companies that can't have machine learning. But you know what has happened? No one has come to him to solve their problems because they're like, oh, maybe because he's in Nashville, he really means entertainment industry problems. And then other people are like, well, he's actually in Murfreesboro, which is a suburb of Nashville, so they, that's where Nissan is headquartered, Nissan USA, is, so they probably mean automotive manufacturing problems. So no one actually said, yeah, let's do this with you because there's no guardrails, right? Uh, if you say I'm going to boil the ocean, everyone knows that it's, it's not going to work, right? So you want to say, this is the box that it fits in, 
And people can look at that box and say, I love that box. It's a wooden box, it's carved, it's beautiful. Or they can say, that's a steel box, it's rugged, it's strong, I want a box for that reason. That's what we're doing at this very highest level of scopes. We define what's in the project, what's out of the project. Um, it talks about the value to the customer, the primary deliverables, a website that does XYZ, a program that they install on their own personal computer that does ABC sets of things. And this is really important, that risks, dependencies, constraints, assumptions, key success factors. Typically, you can do this on one page. Um, not always, but typically you can do this on one page. And this is the kind of uh, the, the source document that you will go back to as a leader of a project when you have a really enthusiastic member of the team that wants to make it bigger. And you could say, no, let's make what we are planning successful, not make it bigger, right? Because with Agile in particular, we'll make it better on an, another iteration. So here's a couple examples if you've never seen one before. This is uh, one of the more traditional style, um, more traditional style scope of works or a scope statement. And so look at this middle paragraph right here. It says, the implementation phase identifies and describes current business practices, verifies and configures the application software. And, it's, and we have no idea what in the world this is actually trying to tell us we are going to be working on. So a lot of those traditional approaches are very wordy, very legalistic, and, and that's one of the downsides of them. You will see them uh, much better than that at times, but it's, it's not the common practice, I would say, today to see these written in a kind of very human, uh, natural sort of um, way. Whereas with um, some of the more agile practices, you'll see a very brief kind of document like this that has a header and one or two sentences that answer what the header asks for, right? What are my high level requirements? Um, well, it's the ability to do both something and something. I can't actually re re read that. Internal and external users to access the application without downloading any software. Okay, that's reasonable. I get that. You don't have to install a 130 megabyte file or any of those. So it goes through just the very highest levels of, uh, of what this is. Then the next point is to actually begin writing our documents about requirements. Now, uh, when I was at uh, another tools vendor that is actually uh, in a booth in the exhibit hall, we had a, a really um, strict set of, we only have 15 minutes to go, by the way, if you're, if you're about to pass out like I am. Um, we had three main documents that we had to produce for, if we were gonna build a new product. For example, one product that we thought about building and we decided not to, uh, we were gonna call it Capacity Manager. So the first thing we wrote was called an MRD, a market requirements document. It's like a lot of DBAs in the marketplace struggling with, struggle with knowing when they're gonna run out of storage space, they struggle with when they're gonna run out of uh, maybe memory or CPU, and so we're gonna build a product to make sure that DBAs are never surprised. And here's what we uh, think about that total of, um, addressable market and so forth. Then we had uh, functional requirements. These are the functions that we need to uh, incorporate into the product to successfully answer that pain out in the marketplace. And that was a, me both of those were medium length documents. The first one might be a, a page at the most, the second one then would be a couple pages in length, and then finally we get to what we call the spec, or the SRS, the Software Requirement Specification. And that's where it'd say, we need a button in this part of the user interface that's blue. And we need another button over here that is red, you know, and we're going to write it in this kind of code. And whenever we have these kinds of issues, we're going to use this algorithm with C Sharp to solve that problem. That's where it gets really detailed. And one of the things that I have kind of blocked off there in those little brackets is we actually didn't think a lot about usability. We didn't have a usability testing team. We didn't have a, a rollout pilot process. So. Uh, we would sometimes launch products back in the early 2000s that people would be like, yeah, it's a great concept, dot, dot, dot. But man, I can hardly, it takes three days to get the thing up and running. Um, so that's a little bit from my own history. Uh, other companies do do it differently, but that's, that's one of the big things. With Agile, on the other hand, though, 
what you're building out for your requirements is you're going to build, you're going to start with a particular kind of person. And you're going to describe that person as fully as you can. And you're going to write a story about what it is that's going to make their life better. So uh, I'll give you an example. We have a, a really popular product. And it's, I apologize that this is self-serving. But it's called Plan Explorer. And it makes query tuning super easy. And um, so we have a persona we call Jenny the Generalist. And she is a person who has to do a lot of stuff. She doesn't have a lot of time. And really, SQL is not her thing, because she's got to keep servers up. She's got to make sure backups have run. You know, she's the, you know, the person who's getting a lot of stuff done in a small shop. But every now and then, the boss says, this report is so slow. Somebody's got to look at it and see if they can tell me what's wrong. And so that's Ginny is the person we built our color coding system for. So when you're looking at a SQL statement and it says this part right here is in red, Ginny says, oh, you know what? This outer join might need to be changed. I don't know a lot about outer joins. Let me look up the syntax for that, right? But that's the idea, is that you build this, this user description and you talk to people who are Ginny the generalists. And again, you know, we uh, have a pack channel. We go, I'm sorry, product advisory channel in our Slack uh, environment, so we can talk to people who fit these different kinds of roles. Yes, question. Do they know they're all Jennies? Do they know they're all Jennies? Um, they know that they are a persona. A lot of them, they don't know all of our names for the different personas. So we have Paul the production DBA, right? And and we have. Um, uh, we have Steve, the senior DBA. He's a little different than the production DBA. Uh, yeah, so they know they're one of those, but they, they're not sure which one they are. The one we like the least is Barry the buyer. And he, he is wearing a suit in the picture of our persona for him. He's the guy who's like, I need more discounts. Um, right? So, um, so we've got this preponderance in waterfall on the discovery side of things and writing it all down. The problem is nobody reads those documents once they've been written, right? Who's going to read a 40-page requirements document? Nobody wants to do that. That sounds like torture. Uh, the agile side is uh, more about delivery. How much document, or actually, how little documentation can we have before we actually build something useful to somebody? And so that's kind of what it's about. Now, who do we get to provide all of this information? It's not just the people that are involved. If you're working on maybe a new version of an existing kind of product, those bottom three bullet points are going to be really useful to you. You're going to build a different product for um, running on SQL Server and maybe using um, Visual Studio. You're going to write a very different product for a radiologist than for a florist, right? Because radiology. They use humongous image files all over the place. And lives are on the line. So you don't want it to randomly drop a, a record here or there. Whereas a florist, right, you know, it's, it's a different environment. So that business domain is kind of the first set of uh, information you would um, ingest to figure out, OK, how, are I, uh, how is that going to impact what we're building? Existing systems and APIs, existing documentation, that's going to help you build out your requirements in those cases where we're building something new based on an existing model. But then finally, interviewing those stakeholders. That's, and that's got an asterisk on it, because it's not a one-time thing. We're going to keep coming back to them. Anytime we're making an assumption, we need to say to ourselves, I really shouldn't assume this. I need to go find out if they agree with this, whatever this um, premise is that I have in my head. right? In broad terms, by the way, if you're looking uh, up more information on this on the internet, this whole process, this stage of the process of developing project is called requirements elicitation. It's not a word you hear very often. Um, it sounds, for me, it's, it, it's, uh, it's one of those $500 words, 500 point words in uh, Scrabble. Um, but it's all about getting to the heart of these requirements. So this is where we get really into the nitty gritty here about requirements. Getting to requirements is really all about that uh, communication loop 
that we talked about in the very first uh, content slide, it's just that they are very structured conversations. We are looking for a specific set of outcomes. So um, the IEEE standard uh, for spot, uh, product specification says uh, a requirement is a condition or an ability that must be met or possessed by a system to satisfy a contract, a standard, a specification, or a formally imposed document. Um, what, what I would like to describe it as, uh, at least delving into the requirements, is kind of structured curiosity, okay? Anyone heard of the, the, the five leading words of journalism? Yeah, uh, shout it out, let me hear it. Who, what, when, where, and why, and sometimes how, right? That's the kind of questions we're going to be constructing to find out you know, what is actually the requirement here. And we're gonna build our questions in such a way that they can give us a, not just a um, qualitative statement, but also a quantifiable statement. How can we verify what this person is telling us? That's one thing. We wanna get as much ambiguity and vagueness out of their response. We wanna eliminate as much as we can. And the, re the way we do that is by using open-ended questions, the who, what, where, when, why, and how, and when we are told something, we constantly reinforce our understanding by either summarizing or paraphrasing back to them, right? So we say, okay, you're telling me that you, you would really like this idea of machine learning for everyone. Um, you like the idea of being able to upload your own documents. Whoops, uh, my mouse took over. Um, your own. So when we say we want to be able to upload a variety of files, you're telling me that you actually do want PDFs included in that. Did I get that right? Help me out here, I'm, I'm a little bit confused. Are you saying we could put upload any kind of file? Oh, no, no, oh, it's just Excel, it's just CVS, uh, CSV, CVS drugstore, CSV, comma, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, it is just these four file types, right? So you come back constantly, and one thing that some people do, which is beautiful, is they'll draw pictures for everything. And I really love that too. I don't have an example of it, but that's a pretty cool, uh, a cool approach to it. It could be one-on-one -on -one in an interview format. It could be a workshop. You can do this with a couple dozen people, and sometimes it's kind of fun. You walk by, you see people workshopping requirements, and you'll see post-it notes all over the walls, and they're like, then they come back, and everybody's written down the requirements. Now we're gonna group them together into here's user interface stuff, here's uh, back-end features, here's front-end features. So you see a lot of things like that. And so here are some of the questions. This is not a list of questions that should be on every one of your requirements interviews or workshops, but these are ones that kind of are so open-ended they can really, really help you move a project forward. Like um, number three there. You know what people like to talk about more than anything else? No, no. Back up. There you go. I heard somebody say it. Themselves, Themselves right? So that's a great way to start. You know, what, what is a good day like for you on the job? What, what is a really bad day like for you on the job? And then they start to tell you. And then Notice at the end of each of these, you expressly come back and say, well, why? why is that? You know, I don't know what it's like to be in the trucking industry. A friend of mine is a lead DBA at a big trucking company, and they have all kinds of things I never even considered. Like if you have a truck that has a chemical in it, a lot of times those can't go near certain kinds of bridges, and they can't go near schools, and they can't go near rail, railway crossings. How are you gonna build a route for that truck under those circumstances? I'm like, well, it's really important that I know the route before the truck leaves the, the, the yard. Why? Well, if something happens to that truck and there's a 60 kids playing in the schoolyard, something horrible could happen. Oh, okay, I get it. Now I understand, right? So this is the kind of process we want to walk through and get to know what it really is about. You know, what does success look like for you? You've had a hard day at the office, at the radiology office. You've been uh, taking MRIs all day. You've been doing... Uh, 
So what does it look like when it goes well? Well, the machine doesn't give me any problems. I don't have to call for support, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So you begin to learn not just about their requirements. You begin to learn the domain, the business sphere in which they have to operate. You begin to learn about things like the legal issues that they have to deal with. And it helps eliminate some of those specific sorts of ambiguities and assumptions, OK? So and as you can tell, I have in blue part of the reason why you might be asking these questions, right? So uh, what if we don't adopt this project that, uh, that you and s several other people here in the office are big proponents of? Well, if we don't do that, we have to contend with the old system. And the old system has all of these shortcomings. You're like, oh, well, why is that a shortcoming? And then they begin to tell you that. So it really helps firm up that list of uh, requirements. And again, if you restate back to them, you summarize back to them, hey, so you're telling me that this is, this is a really big deal, that we know what the route of a truck is before it leaves. You're like, yeah, that is massive. You're like, OK, that sounds pretty hard. Let's prioritize that to the front. Right? You instantly have a lot more than if you had had that structured kind of formalized set of questions earlier. Okay? Now, this little um, slide here is to open your mind a little bit, too, because we all live in our own boxes. Like, I, as a data person, I'm already thinking about data models for this uh, imaginary example of a trucking company I just made up like seven minutes ago, right? So I'm already thinking about, you know, trucking ID or trucking company ID and truck ID and you know, route IDs and all that. Uh, so keep in mind that there's seven dimensions for these different apps, projects you might be building. And so you may have to build specific questions to get to the, the heart of each of these different seven areas in their requirements, OK? Does that make sense? Documentation after a good round of elicitation. I'm jokingly pointing out that waterfall. In my case, we didn't have this big mound of paper on the ground, but we always ended up with massive three ring binders on the shelf. And um, a lot of times, like I said, we never went back to that. Um, but with Agile, one of the things you are supposed to get at the end of the day is uh, you know, a whiteboard with lots of little drawn squares on it with your requirement, or maybe post-it notes like this. And you'll find that teams are often taking photos of those, you know, and they're putting those into the OneNote. Uh, uh, I was actually at a, um, if anyone's from the uh, Midwest, I was actually at the headquarters two weeks, three weeks ago of a, a big grocery chain called Hy-Vee. Anyone know Hy-Vee here? Beautiful offices, by the way, amazing offices. And, you know, I walked by five or six whole walls that were blank, you know, no decorations on them, but full of this. And it was, it had its own kind of beauty to it. You know, I was, I was really impressed. All right, you've probably seen these traditional sorts of re uh, requirements. I'm not a big fan of these, but um, you, you'll see this kind of stuff written out quite a bit. With writing Agile, we have a couple different, um, I'm sorry, we have one main way that we are encouraged to write these as a second step. Okay, the first step is to write the requirements. The second step is to write something called a user story. Okay? And, um, oh gosh, and we have like, what, three minutes left? Is it okay if I go a little, a little over? Okay, thank you for putting up with me. You can go four. Okay, four minutes. <laughs> All right. All right. So, um, you know, when you begin to, to see all of the different requirements, you, you be, begin to build out this initial list of requirements, and bullet points are fine. Plain spoken English is fine. That's not a problem at all. Uh, and you may not even have your user personas identified yet. That's okay, because you begin to understand the story once you begin to ask those questions of, what's it look like to have a successful experience in, in, um, in your business case, right? Then we go to the next step, which I'll have a little more detail in a moment, about writing the user story. And this language is very specific, at least for the agile world, in which you will literally say, you'll literally describe who is doing what. Okay? Uh, like it says here, as a trucker, I can uh, deliver all kinds of things for a fee so that uh, I get paid and the customer gets the materiel they need to continue with their project. OK, well, that makes sense. Now we're going to build more requirements based on that, because clearly you've got to have a truck. You've got to have something to deliver. You know, and so it, it builds on itself. 
another thing that you will see often, and it's, it, again, kind of like all the stickers on the, all the post-it notes on the wall, I think they're uh, kind of endearing and cute, is when you'll see people writing or drawing out little mock-ups, right? Uh, again, a picture's worth a thousand words, and it's very powerful to say, okay, we're gonna have a box here where you'll enter this kind of information. Sometimes you'll see it like on cocktail napkins or something like that. It's like, we built an app that's gonna change the world. Um, so that's, that's fun too. The, the bottom point though is one I want to make really clear. And going back to that Moscow method, right? If, if you are gonna be using Agile, you really don't have to get deep into requirements that are gonna be done six months from now. You're really only worried about one or two sprints ahead. And in general, sprints are not long, maybe a month, maybe a couple weeks. Um, so don't be trying to boil the ocean, right? Just figure out what's the next step in our process. If we are gonna boil a bunch of seawater, well, we gotta get, we gotta get some wood, right? Start with that first level and then go to the next step and define the next set of requirements. One big reason why you want to do that, too, is that it's not uncommon at all to have requirements that change dramatically over time. As a, as a speaker in the world of SQL Server, when Azure was all that Microsoft talked about, oh, wait a bit, that's still today. Um, back when it was first coming out and Microsoft really was outspoken and asking us as Microsoft MVPs to talk about Azure, I wrote two or three different presentations. And guess what happened to me? I'd write it uh, a, you know, a month or two in advance, and then I'd present it, to, or I'd offer it up for a SQL Saturday, and then I'd check my slides before the SQL Saturday, and then I'd go and present, and between Wednesday when I checked the slides, and Saturday when I presented, the option was no longer available in the Azure portal. You know? I'm like, my, my demos are broken, what's happened? Uh, you know, and maybe after 20 minutes of looking around, I'd find that it still existed on a different menu, or it didn't exist at all anymore. They would literally change stuff on you that frequently. So that's exactly what can happen uh, if you build your requirements too deeply, too far out into the future. So here's an example where we've got a functional requirement. It's a couple sentences long. Uh, our fictional company is gonna build a website called Concerts Online, and we're looking for ways to enhance the concert goers' experience. So we're gonna bundle restaurant coupons with the particular concert you're gonna see, right? So we might say, a concert goer, as a concert goer, I need to search for concert-related dining discounts so I can enhance my concert experience. I can go downtown, I can see a show, and I can get a good meal all at an affordable price, right? That's a user story. And it's just a couple, it's not even more than one sentence, but it really clarifies what you're building out there. There are all kinds of requirements, but the two main ones you need to know about are functional requirements and non-functional non requirements. So, what do you think a functional requirement is? Yes, thank you, a button on this screen. And when I click that button, it is gonna do something. Like if it says print, that means it's gonna say, here's your print options. I can turn it into a PDF, I can send it to the printer, you know, that sort of thing. Non-functional requirements are often called the illities, like scalability, maintainability, um, enforceability, right? Uh, and I also always like to point out that uh, performance is a feature. Uh, one of the big problems I saw many times with waterfall specs was they would say something like, the system needs to maintain 200 users concurrently. I'm like, okay, that's, that's a scalability requirement right there. But under what context? I mean, if there's two users on there and one of them clicks print and it takes three seconds, are you telling me that when we scale up to 200 concurrent users and I click print, it still needs to be, uh, you know, finish in three seconds? Yes, that's what I'm saying. Well, you better not assume that that's, <laughs> that you've got to write that out because that's a big assumption. You know, a lot of systems you scale to 200 and they click print, and it's like, go get a cup of coffee, brother, because it's not gonna be showing up in quite a while. Okay, risks and challenges. I've already said this many times before. If you're not talking to your customers enough, if your customers don't know what they want, or maybe they know what they want, and it's you know, a Mozart symphony written in 
two weeks with kazoos, right? Uh, it's unrealistic. Scope creep. Has anyone experienced scope creep? Yeah. Love it? <laughs> yes. Yes. I, I, uh, we should talk offline about uh, creative and uh, diplomatically uh, bulletproof ways to tell your boss no. Uh, because it's very powerful. And conversely, uh, you as an authority figure in a situation like that, you want to te tell developers no. You know, that's a great idea. I love it. Let's put that on a future release. We're going to put that on the backlog, right? Um, and speaking of which, uh, one of the next things we do after um, we have built out requirements and then the user story is we do story mapping. And so everything above the line is what we're working on right now in the next sprint. Everything below the line is something we hope to do at some point, but we're not going to promise it at a specific time or in a specific format. In fact, one of the most powerful things you can do in some cases is you can actually just say no to st some stuff, right? You could say in our fictional machine learning situation, you know what? No, we are not going to accept plain text files, flat files. It has to be an Excel spreadsheet. It has to be a CSV or a tab delimited file. It's got to be one of those. And suddenly your life has gotten a lot easier because you don't have to build a parser for that flat file system, right? Uh, some extra tools. Uh, you know, I talked about users, roles, and personas. I talked about mockups, back of the cocktail napkin sort of thing. There are, uh, continuing down this list, you see them used less and less frequently, things like um, the process model or process maps. But those top three, are essential, and everybody needs to have a really strong release map, too. So user roles, what they're going to get, you've got your uh, mock-ups or low-fidelity low uh, prototypes, and then who gets what when is extremely important. You know, the first thing you release is that minimally viable product, then what comes next? And that's all part of your release plan. Favorite tools to use? Well, there's not really any one favorite tool. A lot of people have different tools, and they use a combination of them. As I mentioned before, uh, the uh, situation we have where there's a, a wall covered in the, uh, all of our notes. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but this wall is covered with smears, too. They did not have a good eraser. Um, so there's all kinds of different tools. But the thing to think about here is that this is going to be a living document. It's not something that's static that never changes over time. I, just to go forward with the same set of ideas, you will see a lot of people using spreadsheets, different kinds of um, artifacts to keep track of things. So this is just one example in which it has a column that uh, talks about priority, if I can find my mouse here. So here we've got priority, and then we've got descriptions and more information as we go along. By the way, uh, download the slides, because for almost all of these, I have uh, a link back to this source so you can reuse this template if you want to or more writing about uh, that particular topic as it moves along, right? So I talked about uh, ordering and prioritizing. I got a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, talked about on the right-hand side, highest risk, most difficulty, do that one first. And then build the others off of those. Also. Um, notice that last bullet point on the right-hand side where I'm talking about best guess estimate of feature sizes, best guess release size. Uh, and then I say, what people are bad at estimating? Developers is true. Who else? Everyone else. Everyone is bad at estimating. So, um, you, you know, from Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, it's like, we don't think of it so much as a uh, a rule as much as a guideline, you know? <laughs> it's like, eh, this is just kind of putting this into a specific, uh, you know, a broader ballpark here. We don't, uh, so when we're estimating and pri prioritizing things, nobody does a good job of that. Um, some people are better than others, but nobody does a good job. All right, so uh, just one uh, or two last slides here. The backlog. Um, you want to um, have other requests, uh, things, that you may not be able to get to in that backlog. 
You want to evaluate them on the regular. You want to ask for feedback from other members of the team, uh, other developers, things like that. There's a lot of tools out here. Some of you may already use them, things like Jira or Visual Studio Team Foundation Services, Confluence. MindJet is a really good mind mapper. And then I, uh, I'm, a, I'm out of time, I'm over time. So I'll just say there's three slides in here about if you are currently working in a waterfall style uh, and how to move from waterfall over to agile, okay? So remember, individuals over Individuals and over interactions over processes and tools. You have frequent and deep interactions. Um, make sure you have a clear idea of the goals and the personas. And um, strive for those on time scenarios that get out the door quickly. There's lots of resources in here for you to uh, do further research on. So, and, and I'll tell you. Uh, if I had this when I started to write the document, I would have been done in half the time because there's a lot out there about requirements gathering under the different kinds of techniques, and you could spend hours just looking at the first page of Google results for requirements gathering, right? So don't do that. Just go right here to the uh, resources page and go from there. So remember how many different problems we had that caused our projects to fail? It's about half of them is like, I think, either four or five out of the 10. And four, I'm sorry, four or five of the 10 that were specifically about communications, right? That's the thing that I want you to walk out the door and remember, is that it's really about structured communications, a deliberate approach to asking questions, uh, getting to the core of what they need, and then building on the, the first round of what your persona needs and then iterating after that, adding more and more value with each new release as you move forward. So we're over on time, but I do want to make myself available for questions. Um, of course, as I mentioned, I'll answer any emails you send me. Uh, if I don't know the answer, I'll certainly make sure to get you um, in, in touch with someone who does know the answer. Also, uh, I'll hang around here at the front for a few minutes, and I'll stay as long as it takes to answer any of your questions. Uh, with that. Thank you so much for taking your time and going over even. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>